Thank you very much for being here and, 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 and welcome. Welcome to you and to your ideas. Great. Thank you very much. So um, as we were um, warming up mm -hmm. for the recording, you told me something very intriguing. I asked you, what do you want to talk about? So what was your response? I was interested to address the intrinsic value of Bitcoin. Okay. So Bitcoin, fine. Let's start defining intrinsic value. Mm. Does everything have uh, an intrinsic value? Well, so I think the thing that people really don't understand well is they really don't understand the concept of value, which is perspectival, right? So what I mean by that is, is that really value has to depend on what the person, where the person is coming from that is doing the valuing, right? So the question becomes, you know, is there an intrinsic value to me? There isn't an intrinsic value to anything because it's perspectival, right? In other words, there may be a person who has, you know, if, if you're about to die from falling off a cliff, that person may not value a bag of diamonds that's heavy and placed on his head, right? So what, I, what I'm so, suggesting so this is... this is almost existential. Does that it mean is. that if the universe didn't exist, it would be the same? Well, what I'm offering is this. Is what I'm offering is, is a specific perspective wherein it has intrinsic value. And I think it's a meaningful perspective. So that's what I would like to offer. So instead of just punting and saying, well, nothing has intrinsic value, which I think is very much a cop-out, I'd like to present a perspective that I think should be shared. And I think that that's where I'd like to take it. Uh, so, value, intrinsic value, intrinsic value of Bitcoin. Yes. Obviously, um, those who come from a traditional economic uh, and monetary point of view will be ready to claim that indeed Bitcoin does not have any intrinsic that's right. value. That's right. right. That's the common. That's the common economic argument. Right. And and um, those who support Bitcoin are vehemently uh, against that. Correct. So let me let me propose kind of my way of reasoning. Right. So my way of reasoning is, is that you have to imagine a person that's in a very high place, right? They're in a top of a building that's being constructed, right? And they're standing on a very thin rail and it's standing on a rail that's known to collapse. So what is this? It is a metaphor and it's a metaphor for our current financial system, right? Which is you know, we can easily say that we as a global economy are in a high place because if you look at the standard indices for measuring the value of the stock market, for example, like the Dow Jones Industrial Average, we are in a high place where we've achieved a very high place. But a place from which we are aware collapse is not only possible, but it is certain, right? So what we do know is factually, we know that the beam that we're standing on in this high place is known to collapse. Right. So uh, everybody's basically doing la 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 la. And this is not on camera, but I'm holding my hands over my ears yes. and, and pretending not to want to hear what you're saying. Yeah. So it's known to collapse. And really, the people may not be reasoning about collapse properly, but because they have bad reasoning about the nature of collapse. Right. And so if you study uh, complexity theory, you understand that there's something called the self-organized criticality that can be modeled as a pile of sand, right? And the thing that people argue is, well, what causes an avalanche? And oftentimes the reasoning is, oh, it's the last grain of sand. And it's like, not really, right? It's like the last snowflake caused the avalanche. It's like, no, not really, right? The avalanche is an emergent property of all the conditions, right? And really the last snowflake was just a it was an inevitable event. Like there's always a last snowflake. So, but but let me let me give you the frame. Let me complete the frame. So so, what I'd like to say is, if you're in a high place and you're standing on a beam that's known to collapse, what is the value of having a secondary alternative beam that may support your weight? Right. It may. Right. And. At the moment, you may it may or may not. Like you don't actually know what this new beam is. You don't know what it's made out of, and you don't really understand it. And you don't really necessarily trust it, which is wise, because a foolish person would trust all of their body weight to an unknown beam, and of course, the unknown beam could be made out of nothing, and you could just die, right? But the question becomes, what is the value? And the value should be proportional to the ability of this new beam to support your weight. So a superficial. Um... Uh, categorization of that kind of analogy could be, oh, okay, Bitcoin is an insurance policy. But of course it isn't because 
insurance is based on actuarial tables, yes. uh, statistical uh, um, analysis of uh, previous uh, uh, situations, Correct. and uh, the kind of scenario you are describing is is, is something that uh, will happen, but it will not uh, resemble previous uh, uh, transformations. Um, what is uh, uh, so so this the second rail uh, for yes. the um, global uh, civilizational financial system yes uh, uh, is, is is a fantastically powerful um, way of, of, of representing uh, Bitcoin's intrinsic value but if somebody wanted uh, rather than a, an architectural analogy yes they wanted to uh, uh, an economic analogy yes. or a monetary analogy yes have you have you or a financial one have you find uh, uh, any yeah so to me there's a variety of different mechanistic ways to describe kind of what it is so you can you can describe it sort of a functional thing you know one of the things that i like to say is that you know about 10 years ago, the internet started printing its own money, right? Uh, one way of framing it could be like, well, email is a good way for the internet to send letters and Bitcoin is a good way for the internet to send money, uh, you know? So it really is kind of this indigenous internet money. So that's more of a functional mindset. Uh, Back to the uh, intrinsic uh, value. Yes. Um, the way I could uh, try to, to frame it is uh, the network value of Bitcoin is the net present value of uh, the ability of saving the global financial system at yes. any time in the future Very good. when Very a good. potential Correct. catastrophe occurs Beautiful. in the first rate. Beautiful. Very well said. And so to me, that gets towards kind of an actuarial mindset. So I think I think you you are computing it, I think, properly in terms of the value. To me, the thing that's very interesting about what we should see and we are seeing is what we should see actually is an attempt to test that hypothesis, right? So to me, there's several properties of what the hypothesis. What do you mean? Breaking the system? Yes. So, <laughs> okay. so, so it isn't testing the actual breakage of the centralized financial system. It's actually testing the alternative's ability to carry the weight. Right. And so and isn't that happening every day? As uh, it absolutely, uh, that's what it is. Groups that's what of it is. Hackers and naysayers and doomsday. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so Bitcoin being dead are doing minute after minute. Everybody is attacking it, which is, it's with, withstanding, right? So, for for example, like if you look at the test to date, right? It's like it's pressure tested up to one hundred and forty billion dollars in terms of storing so it's stored that much value right and to me if you're testing a system that stores value the test has to be both putting value in and taking it out right because it's a, it's you know if you put the value in and you can't take it out it's actually not a very good store right so what we're seeing is we're actually seeing pressure tests at different degrees the thing that i think is interesting that people don't quite understand who haven't been in kind of technology infrastructure is that a test at one pressure level is actually fundamentally different from a test at a higher level. It's actually a different test, right? And people just think it's linear, but it's not linear because what happens, for example, in a system that's attackable is that the economic uh, incentive for launching different classes of attacks actually changes, right? So for example, like when does it become economically interesting to attack Bitcoin with tanks? Right. So it's like, well, OK, rolling tanks against Bitcoin could be a very expensive attack, but it, with sufficient reward, it may actually be like a good idea. Right. So, um, so. Um, I have a certain interest in, 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 in Bitcoin mining uh, yes. as well as uh, uh, proprietary uh, ASIC chips uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, designed and manufactured. Uh, for data center use outside of mainland China. Yes. And uh, the, uh, the, the people who are supporting this project, I tell them, listen, yes, there is a potential financial reward depending on mining difficulty, all those calculations, blah, blah, blah. But one important consideration is the geopolitical cost of allowing mainland China to potentially declare the exporting of mining hardware a capital offense. And very naturally concentrating the ability to mine Bitcoin on continental mainland China, yeah, uh, in a in a manner that becomes desirable at a particular future yeah. uh, uh, point in time. And that's a beautiful case, right? Because what we're just describing is we're just describing the economic 
uh, incentives. And the thing that's very interesting is, is in your case that you described, the attacker that's attempting kind of 51% double spend is actually a state actor, right? So it's a very interesting scenario, right? And the thing that's really interesting when you see high economic incentives is, is that of course there will be state actors involved and as, we are, as we've already seen. So for example, like in North Korea, it's been reported that North Korean hacking groups are now attacking South Korean exchanges and they're extracting large millions of dollars out um, because of the economic incentive structure, right? It's a very, very attractive targets. And especially since they've managed to create these very large uh, custodial piles, right? So they have these very large wallets and those are easily attackable. So, so assuming that uh, uh, this kind of framing the, the um... The, 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 the problem yes. uh, is, 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 is useful. What is yes. your desired outcome? Let's assume that uh, thousands or hopefully millions of people will learn about uh, Rico's uh, solution yes. to the Bitcoin intrinsic value problem. Yeah. As a consequence, they should decide to do what? Yeah, so to me, I feel that it's really a question of individual choice. So I don't provide like investment advice, but to me, the individual choices should be that they should try to understand it from the perspective of asset allocation, so that they should perhaps shave off a portion of their portfolio based on their beliefs about the percentages and the likelihoods of various scenarios. What I do say is that in some ways, it's there is no such thing on earth as a completely decorrelated asset class, because I can tell you that all assets will go to zero if the earth dives into the sun. Right. So like, you know, at some point, like, you know, you can't eat gold, but you can't eat electricity either. So, you know, there's certain extinction, extinction level events where Bitcoin will clearly correlate the Dow right to zero. Right. But what I'm really saying is, is that, you know, within reasonable ranges, you may actually see it functionally decorrelated, which I think is quite interesting. Right. Because then you can just refer to the Sharpe ratio and understand that a healthy portfolio, when you see decorrelation across a reasonable range, is to actually allocate. Right. And so the thing that we see the world doing is in some ways it's testing the new beam, right? Because it's obviously not so foolish just to put its entire body weight on the new beam because it's probably not even ready for that, right? I mean, Bitcoin is quite solid, but it's, you know, it certainly hasn't, it's kind of hard to imagine it holding the weight of the entire world economy. <clears throat> so, you know, the, the thing that's interesting about the testing process is we should see it be tested at a high level and then it should come down and then it should be tested at the next higher level and then come down. Which is and exactly what is That's happening. the pattern that it's exhibiting, right? It's exhibiting that pattern. The thing that's very intriguing about that pattern is, is that it is not tulip mania because what happens with tulip mania is, is that you have an exponential rise, you have a drop to effectively the nominal value, right? Of like how much is an actual tulip worth? Maybe a dollar. $10. Yeah, I mean, it's beautiful to watch and that's nice and it's, it's nice to see it grow, uh, you know. But the point is, is that it should stay down, right? Everyone should have a hangover and say, wow, what were we thinking? That's nonsense, right? But that's not what Bitcoin seems to do. It doesn't seem to, we don't wake up from this nightmare and think like, wow, Bitcoin was rubbish. We're so stupid. Like, it's like, no, we're not thinking that. I actually saw another another analysis, actually, that Bitcoin may be the price, the current price may actually be driven by existential panic, which is a kind of an odd perspective, but more of an apocalyptic existential panic. And that perspective was, was that Bitcoin itself was untrustworthy, which I don't necessarily agree, but that people placing trust in Bitcoin was actually a measure of how little they trusted world governments and large corporations and the rest of the economy. So there's the traditional and then there's the alternative, right? But when you ask the question about outcomes and what I'm hoping for, Right. What I'm really hoping for is an alternative financial infrastructure that's effectively, I would say, more decentralized, because then what happens is, is you get shock absorption, right, which is that you have you get somewhat decorrelated across a wide range. Right. So that when one of them is suffering, the weight can be shifted to another. You know, and maybe not carrying 100% at any given time on each, but it's really more of a buffered, centralized, decentralized hybrid, right? Because to me, as an advocate of what I call open source money, I actually think that we can see an object lesson between what happened with open source software and what we'll see with open source money, which is that if you look at proprietary software, proprietary software is now like maybe 90% open source software. 
but the value of all the companies that are shipping proprietary software is actually at the highest point it's ever been in the history of humanity. So if you follow that logic, open source money should actually take over all of the commodity functions that we expect from money. So whether it's remittances or payments or even insurances or you know any kind of like very simplistic thing in money, we should see it subsumed by open source. But it means that proprietary monies will actually in aggregate have a much higher value because all of these things, it's lowering the cost, right? It's lowering the cost of infrastructure. It's lowering the cost of banks. It's lowering the cost of customer acquisition for banks. It's very, very nice. It's, you know, because the it's commoditization, right? That's... So uh, if uh, open source software allowed the blossoming of new type of uh, business models uh, that uh, were driving new Innovation. Technologies, innovation, For and sure. wealth creation. Yes, we wouldn't see Google, Amazon, Twitter, Facebook existing without open source Absolutely. software. Absolutely, and in turn, we wouldn't see AWS that in it became the it's platform the, yes. for a lot of uh, things. Absolutely, uh, you um, said that very rightly, and I believe uh, open source money is going to create uh, uh, new uh, platforms uh, for financial uh, solutions. Correct. What are the business models, letting the, the banks and the trivial uh, financial applications aside, what are the former monopolies that uh, had control of money uh, that this new platform is going to expose to extreme levels of competition? Ah, ah. So to me, the thing is really just the inevitability, right, of the takeover of essentially all financial applications in open source. Okay. But my feeling is, is obviously that the most slow moving and unchanging are the ones that are, of course, first victims, right? So obviously things like payments and credit cards, you know, things like remittance systems are very vulnerable because when you look for open source, you're looking for platform software that's performing a commodity function, right? Because the commodities, because they're 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 not rolling stones, right? So they're gathering a I lot of I am the moss. interviewer, so I shouldn't... Mm, Please jump but, in. <laughs> uh, let me reformulate the question. Yes. There were certain institutions holding, uh, certain organizations holding monopoly over closed source money. Yes. Open source money beyond the financial applications is going to enable a new level yes. of infrastructure that then is going to disrupt through competition yes. the organizations that had the previous monopoly. Yes. Which are the organizations that had monopoly over a closed source money? Well, I mean, I think nation, the, states. The, nation states are clearly the case. I would say banks are clearly also in that category. Well, banks but, were the recipients of the generous uh, licensing of this correct. monopoly, right? Totally agree. Totally agree. Uh, the, the grantees uh, correct. of this correct. Uh, correct. sovereign uh, uh, exclusivity. Correct. And, and, and here we are in Malta. Yes. And the ability to Malta or the desire and then the ability to be proven of Malta to sustainably play a role. Yes. That is completely out of proportion to its uh, geographical size yes. and its uh, material resources is a signal, an early signal of this kind of disruption. Absolutely. And I think that in a way, the thing that's fascinating to try to understand. So Balaji Srinivasan, former CTO of Coinbase, was saying essentially that there's a game theoretical construct, which is the Thomas Schelling point. And he said essentially that Bitcoin was really the Thomas Schelling point for financially disenfranchised people. And, and it's the Schelling point is based on this almost like a concept of I'll jump if you jump, you know, and you're kind of essentially predicting what the other player will do and basing your moves on what you think the other players will do. And so the thing that's really intriguing about it is, is that like you're really looking for like fat cat countries that are well served by the financial system or basically don't have that much to gain, right? So it's typically the disruptors that will kind of benefit and take advantage of this kind of new system because like they're currently not served quite as well. So, you know, I, I think for sure we're going to see regulatory domicile arbitrage 
in service of kind of more like an open source mindset, right? Which is commoditization, you know? And again, I think that you were talking about this burst of creativity and innovation, which is just related to lowering the cost of the infrastructure, right? And presumably in an open source model, the cost of the marginal cost goes to zero, right? So, we so are already you're radically seeing, lowering the cost. We of are already zero. seeing conferences in reg tech, regulatory technology yes. and golf tech. Yes. Governance and government technology. Absolutely. And uh, our uh, eagerness to create um, protocols uh, mm -hmm. based on blockchain yes. uh, is going to potentially support the very flexible adoption and possibly, uh, you know, multiplication of uh, uh, regulatory and, and governance solutions uh, that will be. Uh, evolutionarily more uh, adapted to a, a future situation of, of nimble uh, value creation uh, under uh, a, a, a situation where we understand Bitcoin's intrinsic value. Yeah, and I think the thing that I would love to say is I love to say metaphorically that we're talking about an alternative financial infrastructure. But of course, like I'm actually from the generation where there was a band called Nirvana that essentially like was the flagship rock band for the alternative rock movement. But what's interesting about that is, is that in that generation, alternatives actually exceeded the record sales of pop music, right? So there was popular music and alternative music. So really, when you talk about like, what are my hopes for the destiny of an alternative financial system, it, which is, of course, that it will transcend and exceed the total value of the uh, mainstream or pop financial system, right? The popular financial system in quotes, right? Because what's funny is, is the alternative became more popular than the so-called popular. When when I when I talk about uh, uh, Bitcoin people who are skeptical, tell me that uh, checkbooks and credit cards and banknotes and wire transfers work perfectly well, mm. and I tell them that's true, and I have friends who are. Uh, already uh, designing uh, the swarms of intelligent robots that are going to mine the asteroid belt. So I wonder whether those robots will negotiate resource allocation using checkbooks, credit cards, banknotes, or wire transfers. That's lovely. That's lovely. And I think that you're really touching a very, very salient thing, which is connected with, like, we're talking at the AI and blockchain conference in Malta, and we're really, to me, the key word is not AI, it's actually automation, right? And one of the things that you're evoking for me is the API economy. Right. And when you look at the API economy, one of the things that evolved out of the web services movement was this kind of out of band gateway based billing and throttling. And, you know, just you're using API calls and I'm controlling it through the gateway. But what happens with open source money and Internet money is it becomes in band. Right. So in other words, the software can actually charge the other software and the coins can actually just flow through the network as needed. So you, you actually gain an automation, you gain automated economies. Right. So you've moved towards kind of serverless autonomous software that can actually now start to make economic decisions, right? The economic decisions are, where do I store this data? Oh, there's a really nice cheap one over here, I'll store it there, you know, or this one's fast and it's cheap, I'm getting an SLA, I'll store it there. You know, so it's, it's really like becomes part of automation, but it becomes the economics of automation. So I think that's that's definitely an interesting and, use and, case. And uh, if we want to go back to um, the net present value of uh, the future economies that Bitcoin and Bitcoin-like uh, systems will support, once you extend from a relatively limited uh, view of the Earth uh, uh, economy uh, to a broader view of the solar system economy, mm. then uh, uh, based on certain assumptions on how uh, we will be able, through these autonomous systems, start to creating wealth at solar system scale, then the calculations of the net present value are becoming quite interesting. Yes, and I think the thing that we need to kind of zoom in on actually is what happened in open source over the past 30 years or so, which is that what we saw is we actually saw a reversal of the expected tragedy of the commons, right? Which is that when you look inside of GitHub, you're seeing what I would claim to be trillions of dollars of value given away for free under free licenses, right? It's a tremendous asset that companies and people are using to create products and it's all given away for free, right? Now, 
ordinarily what one would expect is the tragedy of the commons where no one would contribute and everyone would steal and denigrate and the whole thing would grind to a halt, right? It would just be the most garbage software that no one could use. And of course that hasn't happened to be the case. So when you start to look at things like open source money and the open source money platforms and the applications that form a layer of programmable commerce and programmable money on top, what some people call the apps, but I think of it more as kind of like a robust computational economy on top, you know, that becomes a place where the tragedy of the commons can be reversed, right? Where you can actually see kind of a sharing economy, you know, and it's maybe a sharing economy that's not just strictly of things, but it's a sharing economy of people and things, right? So the coordination becomes a really important function because you're really talking about the beautiful routing of resources of which the internet was created for, right? In other words, what would we have an internet for were it not for coordination, right? So, you know, so to me, that's pointing at, I think, a, a promising way to utilize the internet, which is, you know, now that we've added digital scarcity, we've added commerce, we've added like currency and payment into the internet, we can actually now properly share things that were previously unshareable, right? Because so to me, the coordination function just goes up by like several orders of magnitude and value. And, and of course, it is uh, uh, complex enough to absolutely need uh, the smartest possible algorithms uh, and uh, the likelihood of uh, uh, any of those functions to aggregate uh, uh, around a single dominating player is very close to zero. So a match of uh, federated uh, coordinating entities is much more likely to be able to interoperate in order to find not only local, but hopefully uh, global maxima. Uh, well, uh, and, I, and, and I love the emphasis on the global maxima because one of the things that's super interesting about the inherent property of open source is that open source is effectively a matrix that competes for consent in a two-sided market. It's effectively the consent of the developers who create it and essentially the developers who use it, right? So it's a, you know, two sides, both developers. But essentially the point being that if the market is fueled by consent, then it naturally, it, it consumes externalities, right? So if you have an economic externality where someone's bearing a cost without a consent, open source views that as a market. So when you talk about kind of this notion of expanded coordination and global maxima, as opposed to local maxima, the global maxima are attained through measurement of externality and then tokenization of externality, right? So if you start to create these multidimensional uh, economic ecosystems, then you actually have the proper incentive network for people to consume those externalities. I am intrigued of the disproportionate representation in the blockchain community of people who care uh, for the positive social impact of the things that they do. Since we are also uh, uh, unavoidably uh, driven also by uh, considerations of financial gain, yes. um, the uh, difference between traditional uh, uh, financial uh, operators and, and, and Bitcoin operators who are, in my opinion, looking at the environment, the stakeholders and, and what happens in the world as a consequence of what they do, hoping that what happens is a positive outcome. I needed to understand why that could be the case. Maybe it is because uh, the effort made to understand the mechanisms under which uh, uh, blockchain and, and Bitcoin operate, as you said, very intimately uh, interpreting externalities and as opportunities that yes. can be consumed to create additional value. Yes. Uh, those people look at externalities and say, wow, CO2, wow, deforestation, wow, uh, Beautiful uh, financial exclusion. Let's uh, create value around solving those. Uh, exactly, uh, exactly. Because if you have an externality, what you have is you have someone who's bearing a cost who has not consented. So if you actually provide a system that actually measures the externality and then restores the value to the person, they're going to join that system, right? So that's that's essentially the nature. So what open source does is it inherently drives out externality. So to me, the multi-dimensionalization of the economy across values other than the quarterly growth rate of public 
companies, right? You know, the dimensionalities that, you know, are beyond just the triple bottom line of like labor and the environment, but like as many dimensions as humans have value uh, is achievable, right? It's just an inevitable consequence of a marketplace that competes for consent. And, and uh, the uh, ability to as many people to understand their own uh, uh, advantage and, and, and positive That's outcomes right. That's joining right. these That's communities right. Uh, is, of course, uh, the driver for the unstoppability of uh, these solutions. That's right. That's right. And when we look at it from the perspective of the adoption pattern, like the most finely grained esoteric concerns of externality, you know, like noise pollution or these kind of like, potholes or whatever, like those will probably go last, right? It's really like the big, deep, hard ones like wealth inequality and like unemployment and like these externalities, the like pollution, you know, that just desperately must be addressed as soon as possible that will go first, right? So I think we'll reach a state of refinement where we're starting to like sand off the rough edges, you know, ideally if we're able to solve some of the more fundamental problems first. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a pleasure. This was a wonderful conversation. Thanks very much. Okay.